Hi everyone, it's MJ, the fellow actuary, and in this video, I want to talk about a conversation that I had with an economist. Now, the conversation happened uh, last year in December, and it came about because I was doing um, a little bit of holiday reading, um, checking out financial enterprise risk management, very, very intriguing subject. And um, there was a whole chapter on market risk. And what's nice about this textbook is that it gives you additional resources to look into if you, if you want to know. And of course, I want to like dig as deep as I can. So I was going through the additional resources and I came across a guy called Kevin Dowd who'd written an entire book on just market risk. So of course, I decided to Google him and, um, and then I decided to send him some emails. So yeah, let's check him out. So I decided yeah, to Google him and we can see, there he is. He's actually got his very own Wikipedia page, which I mean, you know you're official when you've got your own Wikipedia page. That's very cool. Definitely a life goal is to have my own Wikipedia page. And he's got his official website, which I came to. And this is where things actually started getting quite interesting because this guy is an economist and well, you check, I'm a professor of finance and economists uh, and economics at, at this university. But look at what he's talking about, mortality and longevity risk. He's talking about pensions and pension metrics. And the more I started like reading up on his stuff, I was like, well, this is very actuarial. Um, and I mean, you know, you come here and you read his stuff. I mean, yeah, financial risk management, pensions. I mean, this is... This is very much like our actuarial syllabus. Um, so what I decided to do was, seeing that he did have his email um, over there, I decided to, to send him an email. Now I just want to say there will be links in the description below to both um, Kevin's homepage as well as to like this blog that he's he started, um, which is also quite, quite interesting. It's, you know, you go to, all the way to the top. It's, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, but he talks about a few things happening in pension schemes and the value of merged interest and, and all these other bits and pieces. Um, so yeah, I really recommend checking this out, especially if you're writing the fellowship exam and you want a little bit more material to check out. So, but again, I'll put the links in the description. What I want to show you guys is the conversation that, that I had with him. Um, so basically, yeah, this is this is his reply that he sent to me. Um, you can see I've got 375 unread emails. I'm horrible at reading emails, but anyway, uh, I did I did read this one, and uh, basically, he's saying, "Dear Mike, uh, you know, thanks for getting in touch." I basically kind of told him who I was and that I do some YouTube stuff. He's like, that's good to know. Um, then I was telling him, you know, how I found him. You know, I was reading Paul uh, Sweeting's textbook. Um, and then I was telling him about how I like to see all of his different areas of research, you know, cryptocurrencies, actual topics. And he said, thank you. That's a bit of a dog's dinner, to be honest. Um, I like how he's, I only thought, you know, millennials used, uh, used those little acronyms there. Um, I want to make a video about you, draw some of my subscribers to your work. So he's like, thank you. How can I help? So I decided to ask him a question. I said, if I may, I'd like to ask a question. What would you say is the most important thing young actuaries should be focusing on? Should we focus on new technologies like AI and blockchain? Should we focus on designing better models and regulations? Should we be exploring new markets? Um, again, this is another acronym, and I think it stands for for what it's worth. Gosh, um, I think that's what it means. It says, I would advise young actuaries not to wander too far from their core interest and expertise as actuaries. I personally disagree with that. I'm, I'm very much for actuaries exploring wider fields and taking the principles that we, we get and applying them to other markets. Um, so it was interesting to hear him disagree with that belief of mine. He says, personally, AI is very interesting, but the question is, what could actuaries do with it? I can imagine build better models, and that is fair enough. There is always scope for better modeling. And I mean, for the actuaries who are interested in modeling, and let's admit that is kind of like the bread and butter of what we do, is to price risk and to do capital models so that we know, you know how to meet regulations and all these type of things. 
AI and data science are introducing some amazing algorithms that we need to be aware of. They're a lot better and a lot more efficient than the old outdated statistical stuff that we learn in the core reading. I mean, if you if you think regression is is the way to do things, then you, know, you haven't heard of cluster analysis and you are a little bit uh, behind. Anyway, coming back to the email. Um, he says, blockchain I regard as overrated. And I do see he, he has got some videos on, on YouTube. I think if we come back here, um, you can see there are a bunch of videos that, that he's done. And he made one that was negative towards Bitcoin. And uh, the comments weren't very, very kind to him. But I think yeah, there's a lot of Bitcoin people that get very, very upset when you criticize it, um, especially when you criticize it in a very sophisticated way like he did. They have to resort to, to insults. Um, so it's good to go check out those videos as well. Um, he says regulation is a problem. Actuaries have a tendency to focus on what they can model and ignore everything else. Ouch, that's like an, <laughs> that's like an insult. Take solvency two. Um, actuaries have done great work on solvency to risk modeling, but few of them realize that these pillars of modeling are built on feet of sand. However good the modeling, the resultant metrics hinge on other building blocks which are nonsense and which actuaries rarely look into. These building blocks including the matching adjustment, the risk margin, various tr transitionals and the ultimate forward rate, all of which undermine the value of the modeling itself. And I've seen multiple sets of slides by actuaries explaining solvency two, in which the slides are not what in which the slides not only got the capital on the wrong side of the balance sheet, but had balance sheets that didn't balance. Now that's definitely not South African actuaries, because South African actuaries, for those of you who don't know, we don't use solvency two. Solvency two is very much a European uh, regulation. In South Africa, we use something called SAM, which also stands for Solvency Assessment Modeling, I think so. Hold on, hold on. Let's actually Google that. SAM Solvency, let's see, what? Solvency Assessment and Management. There we go. Um, so yeah, I kind of like it's it's interesting. So in enterprise risk management, we look at solvency two as one of the things that fits into the the risk framework, um, but we do consider operational risk uh, as well as counterparty risk and all these other things like liquidity and all of that. Um, but that is very much the holistic approach to actuarial science, which is a fairly new thing. So when he's talking about these actuaries. I think he's talking about the older ones. Um, let's see, new markets, maybe, perhaps betting markets. I love, I love betting markets. Gosh, I love. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of fun to do. I mean, not many people know this, but before I started um, my YouTube channel, I've actually got, I've got a lot of YouTube channels. Um, <laughs> most of them don't have any subscribers. But the one that got like, I think 10 or 20 subscribers, it was something called Odd Actuaries, where I worked with this guy at UCT, uh, the University of Cape Town, and we built a model to try and predict the soccer results in um, the 2014 World Cup, that, that's how old it was. But I love betting markets. I mean, I've always thought of an idea of turning um, clubs and soccer teams into proxies of shares. So the idea being that, let's say Man United wins, their share value goes up. Or if they sign a new player, people buy the, the coin and it, it goes up. And I think with blockchain, that could actually become a possibility. Anyway, I am I'm going off topic. Uh, so perhaps betting markets or derivatives. I mean, gosh, derivatives. Derivatives are scary, and it's it's more something that you know the quant guys will specialize in. I mean, actuaries we are aware of derivatives, and we're aware that they're complicated, nasty little things. Um, but yeah, you'll normally have to specialize if you want to go into derivatives. Um, yeah, markets where actuaries can put their formidable quant skills to good use. I would, I would almost disagree with that. I would say that actuaries don't have the sufficient quant skills to go into derivative markets. And it's, it's something that, I mean, you've got the, the quantitative guys or guys who study, um, so a lot of people, they study actuarial science 
and then they decide not to continue the actuarial exams, but they pursue the actuarial maths. And those are the guys that we call the, the quants. And I don't know if you remember from my channel, we did a whole thing with a guy called Yuri, who was a top actuarial student, but has decided to drop out of actuarial science to pursue the maths side of it. Because later on, especially in the fellowship exams, we don't really do a lot of quantifying. It's more um, actuarial judgment and discernment that we, we try and, and build upon. Um, so again, that's it's something I would, I mean, it's a compliment. Um, it, it's weird. I, I disagree with his insults and now I'm disagreeing with, with his compliments. Um, he says, however, one area that jumps out for more attention from actuaries is financial economics. Um, and that's, I mean, you know, we, I mean, I do the workshop in Cape Town on financial economics, although we've, we've changed the name now to financial engineering and loss models, but it's basically financial economics. Uh, it says, 20 years ago in the UK, we had equitable, uh, we had the, the equitable life fiasco, which was in part due to the failure of the UK actuaries to understand how opaque long-term option guarantees, I'm thinking guaranteed annuity options, should be valued. Post equitables, all of that was supposed to have been sorted. The training syllabus were, were revised and the UK actuaries were to be taught proper option pricing. So that's probably why uh, black skulls and stochastic calculus is in our syllabus. So imagine my surprise to discover that a similar problem of incorrect option valuation. Okay, hold on, let, let me maybe take a seat back and just catch everybody up. So what actuaries did back in the day is they created long-term products. And what one of the things that they did in these long-term products is they guaranteed the interest rate. So they said, we will always give you 10% return every year for the next 50 years. And the people who signed on that were like, yay, this is great. But what they didn't foresee was a structural decline in interest rates that happened the world over. I mean, we, we don't understand interest rates um, even today, the fact that they're negative just shows how weird this whole space is. But anyway, so the interest rates went down, but the actuaries had written contracts that had guaranteed or locked institutions into paying much higher interest rates than what they could get, and it was a little bit of a disaster. So I agree, <laughs> I agree that yeah, there was a bit of a was it a failure of actuaries or was it just random fluctuation? that, um, you know, there, there's always the risk that something can go wrong. But anyway, he's talking about something new here. He says, imagine my surprise to discover that a similar problem of incorrect option valuation, in this case of no negative equity guarantees, are endemic in the UK equity release sector. Now, this is interesting because we also have this in South Africa. What people are doing now is these financial industries are saying, hey guys, invest with us we will invest in the stock market and we guarantee that you won't lose any money and how they're supposed to do this is they're supposed to take a derivative a put option on the current price of the stock market so that if there is a fall in the stock exchange the derivative kicks in and that risk has been hedged but i think what's happening is these financial service companies are writing naked options, okay? Which means they're offering these these options to the people, but they're not hedging them. I think some of them are doing that because they're thinking, well, why should we hedge? If I'm hedging, it just means I make less money when I'm right. And they've got this idea that the stock market is going to always go up, which as we know, isn't the case. So the financial institutions that are writing naked calls are exposing themselves to a lot of risk and I think I think this is what he what he's also very very worried about um, Dean Buckner and I have had many arguments with actuaries who don't understand option pricing properly I like I will very so I, I did the fellowship in finance and the one thing after doing the fellowship in finance is that you realize finance is a lot more crazy than than people make it out to be um, I don't even know where to invest after doing the fellowship because it's just it's just chaos out there. So, like I say, I agree derivatives are maybe a little bit above our pay grade and I can very much see there are some actuaries, specifically the ones who maybe didn't do their, 
the fellowship in finance. Remember, actuaries, we can specialize in different things. So the actuaries who specialize in life and pensions and the other liability subjects, they will have heard about option pricing, but they wouldn't have gone into it as much depth as the actuaries who did uh, banking or, or, like I say, the, the investment fellowship. And when you don't know a lot about a, a topic, you do tend to get a little bit of confidence. And I think this is maybe what's, <laughs> what's happened, is that these actuaries... They're aware of derivatives, but they don't understand how flippin' complicated these things are. And um, yeah, he says, we use this discounted projection or real world valuation approach that, gosh, he's being a little bit harsh here, has no scientific justification. I mean, well, look, he doesn't stop. He says, to make matters worse, they defend this approach on the ground that it produces lower, I think this stands for no negative equity guarantee valuations than, say, Black 76 which is the correct approach to use. See, now, I don't necessarily agree that Black 76 is the correct approach to use. Um, and it is something that he even talks about in his in the textbooks. Yeah, I read his textbook, and he does talk about some of the problems with Black 76. So it's not the perfect model, um, but it, I guess it's better than the discounted projection or the other things that the actuaries are, are using. But for those of you who like I say, the black skulls model, the biggest problem with it is the volatility parameter. How do you estimate the volatility parameter um, or, or its whole structure? I think is fundamentally wrong. But as a friend of mine said, it's like it might be wrong, but it's the best thing that we have. Um, hence why it's the correct approach to use. So anyway, coming back to the letter. So UK equity release actuaries, and indeed their professional body, the IFOA, have compromised themselves by promoting an approach that has no scientific justification and doing so for commercial reasons. See, I disagree with that. I, I think, I mean, like I say, I will say that maybe actuaries don't understand derivatives. But to say that our approach has no scientific justification uh, I, I think that's being a little bit too harsh. I think we do have scientific justification. Um, but like I say, I don't think there is any perfect model for derivatives. So it's very easy to criticize what the actuaries use. And like I say, Kevin has even, uh, what you call it, criticized the Black Skulls model um, as well. It's interesting that he calls it Black 76. That almost makes me think that it's something different. Let's quickly just type in... Black 76. I mean, is that not the Black Skulls model? Oh, it's a variant of the Black Skulls model. Um, by Fisher Black. Funnily enough, there was another guy involved in the model called Merton, but for some reason his name didn't get into it. Um, anyway, let's go back. And Merton, Merton is a fun guy um, to actually, yeah, to go and read. I think it's Robert Merton. Uh, there's two of them. There's there's the dad. I think this is the dad. American sociologist is the dad. And Robert C. Merton is the younger one. Um, crazy story. Crazy, crazy story. Uh, there, Black Skulls, Merton model. Um, check out his story. Like I say, it's crazy. He won the Nobel Prize in economics and he lost billions with using the, that formula in long-term capital management. Um Absolutely crazy, crazy story. Anyway, uh, where are we talking about? So I, I disagree with that. I think the professional body has some scientific justification for it. Um, for commercial reasons, that the sector wouldn't be profitable if the B76 approach, the correct approach, were used. 20 years after equitable, we shouldn't be in this position. Like I say, I'm going to maybe conclude by saying I don't know enough, but being an actuary, being super biased towards my profession, I'm going to think that maybe we, I like to think that we know a little bit more about it than it's not as bad as he's making it out to seem. Anyway, he says, this new scandal is on a bigger scale than the equitable and very few UK actuaries are prepared to speak out about it in public. But if Dean and I are correct and they are getting the valuations badly wrong, then this problem will come home to roost just like the equitables did. The UK actuarial profession does not need another hit like that, but it is set on a path where there can be no other outcome. So that's quite a, 
and I think this is why I maybe want to bring it to the YouTube channels because I know there there are actors uh, as subscribers who are a lot smarter than me. So I want to ask you guys, what is your thoughts on these no negative uh, equity guarantees? Um, and do you think it's as bad as uh, Kevin, the economist, is making it out? I don't. I, I see where he's coming from, but I don't think. Gosh, this this is like famous last words. I mean, I mean, I could be saying this, and then tomorrow it's like actuarial scandal. The financial crisis is caused by the NNEGs. Um, why did they not know? Um, but yeah, it's 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 an interesting one. Like I say, it's derivatives. Gosh, what did Warren Buffett call them? Uh, weapons, uh, financial weapons of mass destruction. I think that's what he called them. Um, so anyway, so it seems to me that there is a scandal here, and part of the solution is to revise the syllabus again. No, not again. We've just we've just revised it. I mean, 20, 2019 was like the start of the new syllabus. Properly this time to ensure that practicing actuaries in the UK not only get option valuations correct, but also have a better understanding of why the correct approach is the correct approach, and why the discounted projection approach is not. Like I say. I think they're both wrong, but anyway, many of these issues are discussed at length in our website. The, I don't know how to pronounce that, sorry, the M, I, I googled it, it's some Greek mythology thing, project, and in various reports we have done on energy valuations. Um, I then replied saying, yeah, thank you for your response, you know, sometimes actuaries are accused of you know, we joke that we arrogant science because we tend to believe that our methods are best. Um, and then I s just spoke about how I actually talked spoke spoke about Yuri again. Um, mentioned Yuri's uh, neural network for for option pricing, which there is a video on my YouTube channel where Yuri explains it. I still don't understand it, but it it looks cool. It looks cool. Uh, yeah, recurrent neural networks for mean variance hedging. In incomplete markets, it's it's quite a yeah quite a big one. Um, are they, uh, at least I told them yeah I didn't understand any of it. You can see I actually don't know a lot. Um, <laughs> but then I said job. I said I'm going to make a video um, talking about him, aiming for the end of January, which is the end of January. Um, although he did yeah Kevin did become a little bit nicer in the last email. He says I shouldn't really be throwing stones at actuaries to be honest. We financial economists brought you the financial crisis, and I'm 100% certain that another is well in the offering. Um, and then for your information, um, Andrew, Cons, David Blake, and I have just finished a new mortality model, so I'm going to put a link to that in the description as well. Took me age, ages to do the programming. I'm not a natural. Look forward to hearing from you. All the best, Kevin. I don't know if, if the financial economists can take claim for the financial crisis. I mean... There was the actuary who suggested the use of the copulas. Um, let me show you his name. I think I've spoken about this before on the channel. David X. Lee. So basically, he used copulas with the normal distribution, which everyone knows don't use the normal distribution for financial models. I mean, that's like a huge lesson here. David is the Canadian quantitative analyst and actuary who pioneered the use of the Gaussian copula oh, no. for the pricing of collateralized debt obligations in the early 2000s, which a lot of people then used to price the CDOs, get the high credit rating agencies, which meant that all the big pension funds were like, oh, look, it's triple A, we can throw all our money at it. And then it blew up and we had the whole world recession. So. I don't like how Kevin's claiming the world recession for the financial economists. I think actuaries, we also played a little bit of a part uh, to play there. But what was interesting about this whole discussion was how, how similar actuaries and, I guess, financial economists actually are. I mean, actuaries, we, we do write all of these exams because regulation requires a qualified actuary to sign off of the reserves of many of these financial institutions. But other than that, we don't necessarily have a monopoly on stuff like mortality models, on how pensions should be run, and, and other forms of governance and you know actuarial models. It, it is a little bit of a free-for-all. Anybody can go and do it. So 
if you don't like writing the actuarial exams, but you're very interested in actuarial science, don't give up hope. I mean, there are, yeah, you know, there, there are still plenty of roles for you to play in the system. But yeah, um, let me know what your thoughts are. Do you guys think we're 100% certain going into another financial crisis? Do you think actuaries are wrong to use discounted projections and not black 76? Do you think the no negative equity guarantees are going to blow up? Um, or do you think actuaries are, have, have got us in safe hands? I don't know. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. And um, as always, thanks so much for watching and keep well. Cheers, everyone.